please welcome IRF Summit Co-Chair, Sam Brownbag. Greetings. We are bringing in a panel, uh, and I realize it's late in the day, everybody, uh, but I think this is just such a critical topic. Please uh, have a seat. War in Ukraine. Uh, we're all familiar with what's been taking place. We've watched it on television. We've prayed against it. Uh, as I left Topeka, Kansas, we were receiving into a friend of ours home a young lady, three children that were refugees from Ukraine and were relocating to the middle of the United States. So we're all feeling this. We're all seeing it. We all admire uh, the great courage of the Ukrainian people to stand up. I was just cheering uh, to see them stand up and fight and push them back, but the war continues. There's a huge religious freedom component uh, that's been involved in this as well. We've got two people here to speak on this topic. Uh, one is the ambassador of Poland to the United States, Marek Madurowski, uh, and we're delighted to have him here. And then also the first secretary of the embassy of the Ukraine to the United States, Katerina Smagli, are the two people to speak on this topic. Uh, to talk about what Poland has done both in the war effort and for the humanitarian side of this, uh, and then the first secretary to talk about from the Ukrainian perspective of what has happened there. So I'll just go to each of you, uh, would ask for your comments about this, uh, the war effort. If there's a particular religious freedom angle that you would like to, to uh, comment about, we'd appreciate that. But first, uh, to you, Mr. Ambassador, please. Um, Please let us know your comments. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, a very brief introductory remarks uh, on my part. For my country, religion-based persecution has always been a, uh, a symbol of barbarism and inhumane approach to human spirituality. Uh, our nation experienced itself this sort of oppression, especially under communist rule, uh, for several decades after World War II. In the Soviet universe, atheism was uh, the new faith, the preferred form of pseudo-religion. It was predominantly the Polish Catholics who uh, suffered under the communist yoke. Therefore, perhaps, we are much more attentive than others to all instances of religious persecution. Also today in Ukraine. A few years ago, up in Poland's initiative, the UN General Assembly uh, established the 22nd of August as International Day commemorating victims of acts of uh, violence based on religion or belief. We must not allow individuals or governments all over the world to oppress innocent people only because they believe in a different God or have a different set of uh, tenets. We encourage all of you to dedicate this year's 22nd of August to raise awareness among the international community of violations of freedom of religion occurring today in Ukraine due to Russian years-long occupation as well as the current invasion. Uh, on the final note, Russia utilizes religion as a tool in its disinformation campaigns, fueling the conflict between the Orthocephalus Orthodox Church of Ukraine and uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. We call on Russia to put, put an immediate stop to these actions. Unfortunately, the current Russian war against Ukraine acutely demonstrates that the persecution of religious minorities, as well as destruction of uh, sites of worship, are still commonplace in modern military conflicts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Madam First Secretary, uh, please, your comments. And I, I must say, I, I was really taken aback uh, by the comments by the head of the Russian Orthodox Church blessing the war. I just, I, I really, uh, I, a bit, I was a bit stunned by that, honestly. And I, you, you, there's a large Orthodox community in Ukraine. Most of the people in Ukraine are Orthodox. Uh, I know the Ukrainian Orthodox Church had split off from the Russian Orthodox Church, but still, I was surprised about that, and I'm sure it must have surprised the Ukrainian people. Um, but I appreciate your comments for this group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is that the Yes, 
I think now it's on. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Ambassador Brownberg, thank you very much for putting this panel together. And Ambassador Magyarovsky, pleasure being with you in this panel. I'm sorry that Ambassador Markarova couldn't do it herself due to other uh, urgent commitments in the Pentagon. So uh, you put the very right question. So why the Russian Orthodox Church supports directly this war effort against, uh, against Ukraine? Because Russian Orthodox Church is not just an ideological structure under the Kremlin. It is a vehicle that the Kremlin uses to support uh, ideologically, together with its huge propaganda machine and analysts who work for the Kremlin, uh, and basically Kremlin ideologists who uh, put together this framework that Ukraine has to be denazified, that uh, Ukraine has to be demilitarized. And minutes before launching the aggression, in his televised address to the nation, President Putin specifically mentioned the autocephalous Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church as one of the targets of this denazification policy. Interestingly, that even after several uh, Ukrainian Orthodox churches that belong to the Mo Moscow Patriarchy have been shelled and partially destroyed, like the Svetohirsk Lavra, the Minyan Church uh, in um, uh, Kharkiv, the Moscow uh, uh, Patriarchy and the Russian Orthodox Church has never made a comment condemning uh, the Russian war effort. Interestingly, even Patriarch Kirill in his public sermons says that Russia now has to defend its borders and this comment basically uh, demonstrates that the Orthodox Church of Russia supports the war effort. We even identified that those Russian soldiers who came to Ukraine, they carried on them uh, some miniature uh, uh, icons and if you turn those icons, then you will read uh, some instructions, you know, why they've been sent, uh, with what kind of a mission they've been sent to Ukraine. And among uh, various things listed there is that they have to wipe out uh, the Ukrainian nation. So we now we see that the Russian Orthodox Church is directly involved in the genocidal uh, policy against Ukraine. Uh, there is also the physical component to it because, as you may know, the Ukrainian um, Office of Prosecutor General has already registered and documented 20,000 cases of war crimes committed by Russian soldiers in Ukraine. And among those 20,000 cases, there are 400 cases of um, crimes committed against cultural and religious institutions in Ukraine. More than 140 church buildings and religious institutions have been either destroyed completely or partially. Those are primarily um, Ukrainian Orthodox churches, but also Catholic, Roman Catholic churches and synagogues. Some synagogue, for example, was built in the early 20th centuries. It's a um, very famous uh, religious institution in Ukraine. So let me conclude by saying that when we defend Ukraine now, we don't only defend our territory, but also our freedom of expression and the freedom of religious uh, beliefs. We see what Russia does to people who do not belong to the official Russian ideology in Crimea, where before annexation, illegal annexation in 2014, there were more than 2,000 religious organizations and uh, the policy of wiping them out simply required to them to re-register. Uh, so as of today, there are only 700 religious organizations left and Ukrainian Orthodox Church is one of the primary target of um, Russia's policy of oppression. Also the uh, Crimean Tatar Muslim communities, you may probably know that there are 80 uh, political prisoners now in uh, Crimea, mostly Crimean Tatars who belong uh, uh, to uh, Jehovah Witnesses religious organization, which is officially prohibited in Russia and automatically is now prohibited in Crimea. So for us, this war, as I said, is uh, a war for our territory and it is also the war for our everything that we hold sacred, our democracy, our freedom of expression, our freedom of religion, and we want to thank uh, all our partners and allies, and first of all, the partner that is present with me in this panel today, Ambassador Magyarovsky in Poland, which has been providing extraordinary support, exemplary assistance, and of course, everything that we see now uh, with the Biden administration and the US government and ordinary Americans who uh, support us in so many different ways. So thank you very, very much, and again, thank you for having me here. Well, thank you.
We all admire uh, President Zelensky has gone, uh, to me, has just become an incredible global figure of courage. Uh, I'm just really impressed with his willingness and his, the fighting spirit I've seen from the Ukrainian people. It's just been such an encouraging thing, and I know it's been such a devastating war to Ukraine. And I also want to thank the Polish people for the humanitarian assistance and the military assistance that you've provided to the Ukrainians and the, the work that you've done uh, with them. I, I, uh, I guess it's, it's just really inspired a lot of people uh, to be able to see what everybody kind of people thought would be the Russians rolling in and rolling over Ukraine and everybody else fought back and that has not been the case. And it's really hardened everybody. Uh, since, since you mentioned President Zelensky, I believe that he is now uh, facing an extraordinary challenge, namely uh, the genocidal intent of President Putin and the Kremlin to exterminate the Ukrainian people. And we were using this term genocide, uh, mentioned, by the way, a few minutes ago by one of the speakers here, coined by a Polish uh, lawyer and diplomat many years ago. Uh, we were using this term at the beginning of the war pretty frugally and very carefully. But now I think few people have any doubts whatsoever what is going on on the ground in Ukraine, uh, having seen all those unspeakable atrocities committed by Russian troops and ordered uh, directly from uh, the Kremlin. Uh, Putin wants to erase the Ukrainian nation, its identity, its legacy, its language, its culture. And that's why uh, Vladimir Zelensky is facing such an um, um, exceptional challenge right now, defending his own nation, but also fighting for uh, our freedom, all Europeans. And this is so important for us, and I, I, I believe this is one of the reasons uh, Poland has behaved uh, in this uh, particular manner since the beginning of the war. You've been both impressive. Let's give them both a round of applause for their countries they represent. Thank you.